Welcome to Saving Vegas. I'm back working on the D9 restoration project that I've been doing for quite some time now. At this point, I've got the structural and cosmetic part of the restoration finished. So uh, I'm really happy with how it turned out. With all that taken care of, they look awesome. I'm happy with the way they turned out, but it is time to get to the more important part uh, my favorite part of restoring speakers is crossover upgrades. I'm not going to be modifying the crossovers in any way. I'm more or less going to be replacing capacitors with better ones and other components like inductors, stuff like that, and get these things back working the way they should. Before I start messing around with the crossovers and pulling them all apart, I want to pull them out and test everything the best way that I can. The digital multimeter that I have can test capacitance. So it's pretty good for testing capacitors. I hope to upgrade and get some better testing equipment in the future so I can get a better readout and just a better reading of what these capacitors are. But I can use the multimeter I have now. It's good enough for what I'm gonna need to do. I am gonna pull the crossover is out and just go through some of the things with you guys. When I first purchased these speakers, they did not sound good. They didn't look good. I bought them because everything was there. All the components were there. I didn't have to really find any parts, pieces. All the mids were there. The tweeters, uh, unfortunately, were not the right ones. Original ones that would have came in the D9s, I'm still on the hunt for those. But for right now, I do have, they're the proper tweeters. They are the, the lower power handling tweeters. So for the sound quality, when I first bought these, I was really disappointed. The woofers had a large amount of distortion at higher volume levels. And I'm not talking like extremely high level. It was slightly above moderate. In my opinion, the VS120s that I use in my shop all the time beat these things hands down sounded way better they got louder it wasn't as hard on the ears which i was a little surprised by and immediately assumed that there is going to be some issues and the crossover is the first and best place to start looking for um, some of those issues so i'm going to get one of the crossovers pulled out and i'm going to get it on the uh, bench here and i'm going to go through a couple things and do some testing on them and who knows, maybe it'll even help you guys out if you're having the same issue. Let's just get to it and I'll show you guys. Okay, now that we got the crossover removed, flip it around and um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on with these D9s being a, a four driver three way uh, setup and not the greatest quality of parts used. And um, this isn't uncommon by any means. A lot of speaker manufacturers will do this. I find they usually tend to cheap out when it comes to the components used in their crossovers because it's a part that's never seen when you're looking at them. And when they're brand new, and everything's all good at in spec. They sound pretty decent, but over the years, some of these parts are gonna start to go bad and it's really gonna degrade the sound quality of these speakers, which for these guys is going to be the case. So if you guys are kind of experiencing the same thing I was talking about, I was getting a lot of distortion from the woofers on both of these speakers and at first, I wasn't 100% sure what the issue was going to be, but after pulling these crossovers out and taking a look, um, I knew the woofers on these D9s were filtered, which uh, a lot of the older models, the woofers are wired direct and just left to uh, roll their frequency off naturally. That is not the case in these D9s. The woofer themselves are filtered. so. If we start off here is going to be your main power coming in. So this is the, this purple wire here is connected to the positive on the speaker terminal on the back of the speaker. So this is your main incoming power. 
and that's going to lead to your circuit breaker. So you have power in, and this is your overall, um, sorry, not circuit breaker, but fuse to protect the speaker. And it is a 2.5 amp slow blow fuse that is to be used in here. There really is no need to go any higher. So main power coming in off here. This inductor here is in series that goes to the woofer. And then we've got a connection here on the corner. And then this is the red wire. This will go to the positive lead on the woofer. And if you notice, we've got, try to move some of this stuff out of the way. So if you look here, you've also got an electrolytic capacitor in the circuit for the woofer. And a lot of people think that this isn't really going to have any effect or do anything because it's, uh, if you watch, if you, if it comes off this connection here and it leads to your ground just because it's uh led to the ground doesn't mean you're not going to hear what's getting filtered or what's not getting filtered i guess that what's passing through that capacitor oh it is ac current that is running to your speakers so alternating current your current is periodically changing direction so you are going to have stuff passing through so that is one of the main things I think that people kind of get confused with these crossovers. Because this inductor is comes in positive lead and then straight to woofer, this would be considered in series. So this inductor is wired in series and then this capacitor is wired in parallel. This would be a second order crossover on the woofer itself. So if you see here, I did have to solder these two wires back together and uh, not because it was broken because I'm the one that actually clipped it. When I was trying to figure out what was going on and then trying to diagnose the distortion, I figured, well, if this most likely is going to be the cause because there really isn't much that can go wrong with an inductor. Yes, these can go bad and yes, you will hear the difference if they're no good. So I'm going to test this guy. And because it's 10% plus or minus tolerance, 100 microfarad, it can be out 10% plus or minus, and that would still be considered within spec. So I'm expecting a reading on here no less than 90 microfarad and no higher than 110. Um, anything lower or above that is going to be considered bad if it's still there and within tolerance. Um, either way, I'm going to change it because electrolytic caps are fairly cheap and it's only a few bucks for a new one and then you know it's new and you're going to give these uh, crossovers um, years of good life to come come yet so these usually like anywhere like 20 30 years like 20 25 years is usually kind of the lifespan on these guys and again it can be less uh, maybe a little more it's a lot of it's going to depend on how they were used and what kind of power and how much power and if they were abused and I've seen some pretty bad ones. These are actually not too bad. None of these, uh, here's another electrolytic cap in here. None of these caps are bulged or leaking or, uh, or <laughs> I've seen some of the coating on the outside, that jacket uh, melted, which uh, tells me there was a lot of heat generated in the crossover. So these ones are actually pretty good considering most of the ones I've seen, but let's test this guy. I do have my multimeter and it is one that will test capacitance. So if you guys are wondering, it's this setting here. This is gonna be um, your test. I'm gonna set it here to test capacitance. I said I hope to upgrade to better testing equipment in the future, hopefully near future. And it doesn't matter which positive, negative, which way, it doesn't matter. Like I said, they're a bipolar capacitor, so there's the lead. Make a good connection and test on there. There we go. Now it's going to do its thing. So this one's testing at 111-ish. We'll call it 112. Um, it is outside of its tolerance. Not by much, but it is. Being that it's out, and like I said, even if it wasn't, I'm going to be changing that one. So we know that one's about 112. This here, get you guys a close up here. 
This is a 15 microfarad. Again, it's an electrolytic cap. This is actually in the signal path for the mid range. Now I'm one of the things when I'm doing capacitors is I really, really don't like having any kind of electrolytic caps in the signal path to the tweeter or the mid range. This is also one other one that I'm going to change regardless if it tests good or not. I will be going to a polypropylene capacitor because I want these things to sound really good. Let's get on there. Oh. And let's see what this guy comes in at. So it's not terrible actually. This one's right in within spec, so it's pretty good for the age of these. Um, I believe these are 1988, these D9. So, you know, we're knocking on the door of, uh, you know, 35 ish years or so. So that's actually pretty good, but we got something better. That's going to sound way better. So those got to go. So what I've got here is the new caps that I'm going to use for these guys. So these are Dayton Audio. They say audio grade. It is a 15 microfarad, so the same that's in there. And these have a 5% tolerance. So it's going to be, uh, it'll stay within spec a lot better, hopefully. But um, let's find out. Look at that, 15.06, so that's right within spec. So that's good. Those are gonna be the new ones going in. These two are gonna be for the tweeter circuit, and this one's gonna be for the mid. Now I've got this bipolar electrolytic cap. This is a brand new one. Um, these are super cheap. I don't even think this was two bucks. I think it was a dollar or something. Figure, might as well test this guy too just to see what this one's coming in at. So it comes in at 107. So which leads me to believe this is probably a 10% tolerance as well. You might wonder why I went with a electrolytic capacitor here instead of a polypropylene after I talked about how where the sound quality can be with electrolyte caps is mainly because it's just in the signal path for the woofer and the lower the frequency that you're filtering the less you're going to notice the quality of capacitor used so i priced out polypropylene 100 microfarad caps and they're about 45 50 bucks a piece and they're very large it would have made it very difficult to fit into this crossover and look neat plus i just didn't think it was worth the money for what that cap is actually doing and I'm also going to, because I have put a lot of time and energy into this restoration of these speakers, I figured I'm going to spend the money and I'm going to do new inductors as well. Now I had mentioned um, all of these, there's three inductors on this crossover. They're all solid core, um, cheaper, lower quality inductors that are used. So... If you go to, and these aren't even really like a ton of money either. I think this is a being the bigger guy. It is a, um, an 18 gauge. Yeah. 18 gauge three millihenry inductor. It's an air core inductor. So nothing in the middle. These are going to help with the mid range and tweeter circuit. Cause in those signal path, we do have this inductor, this one, um, this guy here being in the signal path for the two mid-range drivers. And that one is going to be a 20 gauge. And this is a 0.5 millihenry air core inductor from Dayton Audio as well. And this is, if you see here, this inductor, this is actually for the tweeter side. So what the inductors do is filter high frequencies, which you're probably asking yourself, why would there be 
uh, an inductor in the signal path for the tweeter. Well, it is in parallel to the tweeter. So it's going to pull some of the, um, the lower frequency is going to uh, pass through here and filter to ground. It's wired in parallel. So that's why they've got this on the tweeter circuit. And that guy is going to get replaced with a 20 gauge 0.2 millihenry air core inductor. Also, again, by Dayton Audio. So I'm going to be getting rid of everything on here. Well, not everything. Um, resistors I'm keeping, all that's staying the same. I, there are better resistors a guy can get and use for these, but I don't see the point. Um, the biggest thing is going to be these components here, the capacitors especially. And then, uh, yeah, just a little fancier upgrade for these nicer inductors. Problem being, uh, size can become an issue sometimes when you're fitting all these in. So I kind of have an idea. I'm probably going to be building kind of a double decker crossover. I do have some, uh, like a plastic puck board material that I'm going to cut out to size and, and put in here. So I'm pretty much going to keep most of this stuff as I can. Um, these capacitors are also going to be larger. This is actually a pretty big electrolytic cap for a 15, but, uh, the polypropylene Dayton audio cap is still larger. And even with these guys, we're a little, the diameter is a lot bigger. Uh, it's a little bit shorter, but that's going to be for that one. And then this is about the same. So that's going to work out nice. I can probably keep those right there. So that should work out really nice. And then again, this one, the new one is a bit larger. I hope to keep that one right there as well. Uh, I believe I'm probably going to have to move some stuff around on here because I am going to try to get this air core inductor um, right in place where this guy was. But I'm going to be moving these, getting these two removed because uh, this is going to help make some room for all the caps on this side. And then I'll double decker it and probably have, well, at least these two inductors kind of sitting up on the top. And then I'll have some things labeled and have all these wires kind of come up through and just try to keep everything as neat as I can. Okay, so I'm going to be kind of starting one by one when I do this. I know I'm going to probably get rid of this and this inductor and this inductor. I'm not going to get too carried away with that just yet. So I'm going to pick a side to start on. So this I'm just going to clip off of here. And then, so a lot of times it's not too bad. It's usually just hot glue they used on here. So it's usually not too difficult to uh, pop these off. Like that was nothing, nothing at all. Really. Um, it starts getting hard and crusty over time. So that was pretty simple. Here, I'm just gonna snip there. So this is the original one used. This is a five microfarad capacitor and uh, the 20% tolerance plus or minus on this guy. So 5% um, is gonna be, it's gonna make quite the difference. Um, I don't know what this one's tested at, but maybe I'll go through and test those later. But for now, I'll put that aside. And then when I'm taking this stuff off, I like to get as much of this old glue off as I can. And then also this inductor. So because I got to do some modifying and moving things around, um, usually I don't get too carried away at taking too much off at once. You start pulling everything off and then you might forget um, how everything went back together. So beauty thing when you're doing speakers, you got two of them. Uh, you can always have the other one out set to you and then you have know exactly how everything's going to go back together. So if I wanted to, I could just strip everything off here and start fresh, but I'm just going to slowly kind of go one by one and uh, make it nice and simple. So here we go. Let's get at it. OK, 
Okay, so I ended up getting pretty carried away and just kind of started removing everything. I've got a really good idea. I know how everything goes back together. The one thing I didn't mention before, and um, I did kind of mention how it was soldered here because I had cut this. Um, the reason for that being was I was talking about the distortion that I was getting from the woofer at a um, little higher volume levels. And I had a suspicion that it was this guy that was causing the issues. This capacitor filtered to ground. So all I did is I just opened up, took, this capa or took the crossover out of the, the D9, and then I just snipped it right there, obviously. That's where I soldered it back together afterwards. Um, just to see if that would make a difference in sound quality. And it did. 100% it did. Um, a lot of the distortion went away. Um, the only difference that's really going to have to do with the quality of sound is you've now, um, by snipping that wire, turned it into a first order crossover. So the slope of the higher frequencies from the woofer, uh, the slope that it drops off at isn't going to be as steep. So you're actually going to get, a, you're going to end up with a little more um, higher frequencies going through the woofer uh, as it was intended to from factory. But it was a vast improvement from what it was. So if you guys don't feel like recapping these and you're having that issue where the woofers don't sound right, um, it's a quick and easy little way to cheat to get a little better sound. Um, open her up and just give it a snip. And it's as easy as that um, until you order parts and replace everything or keep it that way if you want. I didn't notice a huge difference in everything else. It still sounded really good. You just ended up with a little more, uh, a little more higher frequency you coming through the woofer than was intended. So, um, obviously the way I'm doing it by replacing with all this stuff is going to be a much better way to go about to solve that issue. But that's just uh, thought I'd share that with you guys. A nice little quick, easy method. Okay, so I got most of this cleaned up. Uh, I'm not like, wasn't like super concerned about this being clean, just more or less. Wanted to make sure there's a nice, somewhat easy, even surface to, uh, to glue everything back down on. So that's gonna be good enough. Don't need to get too carried away. Never gonna see it when it's done anyways. Just wanted a good, secure glue job okay now we can start uh getting some of this put back together or start uh at least trying to lay out how this is going to all work this is the five microfarad um i was not able to get an exactly a five i was able to get a 5.1 um now being a tighter tolerance and being 0.1 off is not going to make a huge difference it's still going to be an improvement above this guy so i wouldn't be too concerned about getting dead on the same value uh within 0 0.1 0 0.2 or so i try to get um but yeah so that's going to be the replacement for the for this guy which we pulled off here and like i said i'm probably going to end up building a kind of a double decker to get these inductors onto or at least the two smaller ones i'm thinking um this guy's got some pretty good weight to it so I kind of like to have this I don't know put it in there somewhere I'm gonna have to figure out how I'm gonna make that guy fit to hold that old inductor into place but I might have to kind of take this little tip off of here and then I think it'll fit in there pretty nicely Might even have to take this one out because I don't want, you got to think about putting these back in. I don't want anything to be um, overhanging this edge here. I want it all to be on the inside so it fits back into the cabinet really nice. So I'm going to keep uh, placing these out and just try to figure it out. So I could have the inductor set on its side like so. Um, I don't know if I like, it would fit in there better if I do it like that, but I'm not going to have as much surface area to glue it down. 
this guy has a little bit of weight to him so I'd prefer to have it down this way and I got more uh, surface area to glue to and then I know it's not going to go anywhere. Um, other than that, the fact that I'm going to move that other small inductor really helps out with me being able to fit these new caps in. Um, again, the size difference from the electrolytic cap to this guy is, you know, there's a little bit there. Uh, but it seems to be room, and as well with the other one. And then this is, uh, this one is also slightly different too. If you look here, this is uh, on the tweeter signal path. That's a 2.5 microfarad uh, capacitor. And I wasn't able to get a 2.5. I didn't want to put two and put them together. So uh, closest I got from Dayton Audio was a 2.7. But again, 20% tolerance, 5% tolerance. So this is still a better option. Yeah, I think I got it figured out. I'm gonna have to take out this guy and this guy and that should fit this in here just nice like that if those two are out of my way. So hopefully these come off nicely. Just gonna try to use my knife. So I'm able to make this end here. I'm able to make my connection as well as here. If I, I can make my connection there using part of the old inductor, um, like so. So that's gonna work out. Let's just make sure everything else is gonna fit. Here we go, lots of room. And then lots of room too, even for this guy um, to put in there after the fact so that's pretty simple so I'm gonna start connecting some of these um, make sure all my leads and everything are gonna reach yeah and start hot gluing some of these in place because I kind of like where they sit for I'm gonna start I'm gonna glue this guy down first Okay, now we got uh, pretty much everything glued down that we need. The only thing really left to do now, other than tying everything together, is uh, I do have to remove this inductor here and hoping that won't be too big of a deal. It kind of looks like they've got it tucked in underneath the potentiometer. This inductor is joined up right here and then uh, comes out and let the ground. So now I know what I got, I'm gonna tie everything together now. Um, also, I'm gonna be doing new wires as well. And, and also, I should mention this, I'm gonna be cleaning up these potentiometers as well. So. So I know a lot of people use uh, the D5 deoxit for uh, cleaning pots and, and switches and stuff, and it, it works pretty good for that. But I like to use um, the F5 deoxit. It's a fader lube, so it's really more for kind of your your uh, faders and whatnot. But I this stuff um, also lubricates uh, a little better, uh, and it also cleans. So uh, I use this for basically any potentiometers or faders and I use the D5 for uh, switches and, and stuff like that. You can also use the D5 to clean and then uh, as long as you hit a little bit of this in there to kind of lube it up after the fact to protect um, all the contacts and everything in there. Uh, I just, I like using this. And it, it gives you a nice feel too. It doesn't uh, clean it right up so it's super loose. Uh, it will be after you use the D5, but then after you put uh, the fader lube in there, it, uh, you can feel it kind of almost tightens up a little bit, kind of gives you that nice feel. <sighs> oh, 
Okay, but now with those potentiometers all cleaned up, they feel nice and smooth and everything's glued. I can start uh, making some of these connections. So I also like to save um, all the wires I pulled off. I also had a couple ground wires that fell off um, as well as I was playing around, but I like to save all that stuff. And then when I'm cutting my new wire, um, I can cut it to the same length, usually maybe just a little bit more just because, but uh, it's a very, very small, like probably like 20 gauge wire that they use maybe, maybe 22, it's pretty small. Uh, so I'm gonna be using 18 gauge copper wire, not the, uh, not the crappy copper coated aluminum stuff um, that I'm done with, put that aside. So for this, this would be uh, going to the tweeter so I'm going to be soldering this connection and then off this end, uh, this goes to the tweeter. So I'm just going to solder that one on quickly because I know that's where that goes. Okay, so now I've got everything nicely secured. That's gonna hold that in place. It's not gonna put any extra tension on that. I might add a little more solder in there. That guy's nice and down. I, I just don't want this to, to contact here or anything. Just wanna make sure all my connections are gonna be nice and nice and tight with each other. This inductor needs to be, I'm gonna do this one first I think yeah so I'm gonna make the con uh, the connection for this inductor if you notice the red coating on this wire and then at the end of it it's there's no red coating you're gonna have to take because uh, I, I, I cut this I'm just gonna have to take this red coating off of there before you're gonna be able to solder it otherwise it's not gonna make a very you won't be able to solder it um, until that part is done. I find the best way to do that easiest, you can just use sandpaper or whatever and kind of scuff it off or anything that's gonna take that off. Um, I usually use uh, my Dremel tool with a sanding end on it. And then with a really low speed. And that's what it should look like when you're all finished, all the red coating taken off. I'm gonna end this part of the video off right now. It's already getting pretty long. Uh, I've got more to do yet and lots I wanna add in this video. I need to cut the new piece to double decker the crossover to make room for the new inductors. I'm gonna use a few screws to lift it up high enough. Makes room for everything underneath. 
Uh, I'm hoping it's going to sit something like this and look nice and neat with all the wires brought through there and labeled up really nice. I also want to do some SPL tests at different frequencies, probably the crossover frequencies, just to see if there's any major differences. I'm going to use a frequency generator to do so and uh, yeah, get to A and B, the old and the new. But for now, I'm going to end this video off. Next one coming out, hopefully soon. And remember, Serban Vega, big or small, save them all.